Uh, thank you, Dr. Andrews. Uh, so wonderful evening to you. Uh, so I'm Karthik. Uh, I work for SAP Innovation Center uh, right here across this, <laughs> this uh, street here. Uh, so I'll just give a brief. So uh, in this presentation, I'll be talking about sentiment analysis, uh, how it could be used, and possibly how do we make a TensorFlow sentiment analyzer. So, so uh, just a brief introduction. So I'm, uh, I'm, I do data science uh, research at SAP Innovation <laughs> Center. Um, so where we work on machine learning for the enterprise. So we try to uh, you know, have uh, natural language processing, uh, do image analysis uh, at the enterprise level. And uh, I, I also work with the team which actually does uh, the machine learning, the natural language understanding part of it. Uh, I'm also a, currently a Google developer expert uh, on machine learning. And uh, uh, I have other talks as well. I do do uh, uh, some talks on uh, images and uh, using TensorFlow uh, and uh, doing on Google uh, Cloud as well. Uh, and I'm a proud alumnus of NTU. Uh, I did my PhD at NTU, and uh, I, I'm, I'm working in NTU uh, from in Singapore for close to four, four and a half years now. And yeah, so let's move into the objectives for uh, the evening. So uh, in, this, in this talk, we will be talking about sentiment analysis. What is it? Uh, why do we care? And uh, what is in it for us? So basically, uh, we will talk about some of the NLP techniques, what are the challenges, and what, why is it so difficult to actually uh, make an NLP, uh, say, uh, uh, of algorithm for, to say. And uh, we'll also see probably ways to improve and uh, think about uh, some of the challenges and how do we go from here, probably from a theoretical standpoint to something on a practical level. All right, so what is sentiment? So one of the fundamental problems with uh, human language is that uh, we all have different ways of talking, we have different accents, we have different ways grammatically, we speak at different speeds. So uh, one of the fundamental challenges is that uh, understanding sentiment becomes uh, you know, sentiment itself, the word itself is, is, it has a gradient. There is no yes or no, true or false. So in this case, so the strange thing is that it works. It's basically something, uh, so these are uh, sentences that I took from a data set. So uh, this is actually quite neutral, if you say. But uh, this is actually uh, classified as, uh, is actually positive. So uh, something like shattered image isn't complex. Uh, it's just stupid and boring. So this is uh, obviously negative. So in this case, so, so there are actually a mix of words which are actually positive and negative, and uh, the entire uh, sentence actually together brings in uh, the actual sentiment. Uh, so in this case, it's actually, if you see the first half of the sentence, is actually, uh, it says it's stuck in the past again, but it has to do something better than the code. So here what happens is you have a mix of positive and negative, but in this case, this is a positive sentiment. So uh, you see that uh, sentiment itself uh, is actually quite debatable. So I, what I would think is positive might not be positive to you. It might be probably neutral. So that is where uh, you know, uh, the entire uh, you know, the natural language uh, processing, the, the entire research actually goes afraid. So like, just like Dr. Andrew said, uh, it's, it's very difficult to actually uh, you know, put forward what is true and what is, what is you know, you, you cannot say that this is the way it has to be because uh, in, in general, uh, we, we have a lot of uh, subjective uh, understanding of certain things, uh, and probably it, it's regional, uh, it's cultural, so all these come into play when we actually talk about uh, natural language understanding. So another example is uh, far from bewitching, the crucible tests the patient, so things like this, it's, it's negative. So, but, so this is where we are actually seeing how do we uh, solve this uh, challenge. So why does it matter? So one of the fundamental problems is that uh, uh, sentiment has a big uh, impact, so possibly one could be on stock prices. So there, there was a, a study that did uh, that actually said that uh, positive sentiment or negative sentiment could actually affect uh, your brand value or stock prices. Uh, so for instance, Samsung uh, took a huge hit when uh, Galaxy S7 actually was uh, in, in the news, and people are talking about it on Twitter, on Facebook, so it actually, uh, the, the stock price actually took a, took a dive. And another problem is something like uh, you want to understand how your customers perceive your product or probably your brand. So if you go to probably eBay, uh, you will see that uh, there is actually a feedback about the seller. There's a feedback about the buyer. So in general, people will buy 
from a seller who has probably 95% or more or 98% or more. I would generally go for someone who has a 99% scoring. So this is actually very important because uh, people uh, give a, uh, you know, a rating for the service that you've given, uh, which means that this is a stand of quality versus trust. So uh, in general, so I would always want, uh, you know, this is what is a positive sentiment here. And uh, this has a potential to uh, 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 you know, change history again. So uh, uh, this, is, uh, this uh, change history is actually pretty strong. So if you see uh, back in November 2016, so almost, you know, we had a huge change uh, in history, and uh, you all know what's happening right now on a daily basis. We are getting uh, large doses of comedy and uh, uh, fantastic, uh, you know, times on the news. And so this is what is going to, you know, a sentiment actually affects um, a lo lot of uh, industries, uh, right from politics uh, to uh, electronics. So, so it affects almost every, every uh, aspect of life. Um, and like I said, it affects trust uh, as, a, as a brand, as a, as a system, as a person. So as a system, it could, be, it, it could affect an entire government, for instance. So if there's a corruption scandal, then the government is blamed for that. So in general, uh, sentiment is actually uh, quite an important topic uh, for a lot of uh, brands and a lot of people. So this is an example. So this is an example that I said. Uh, this was in a paper. This was a study that they said how Twitter affects um, you know, the stock price or uh, how it affects the results. So in this case, if you see the, uh, the trend here, uh, so the first one is about uh, uh, the opinions uh, after the day of an election and the opinions uh, near Thanksgiving. So these are all uh, how actually people are, uh, you know, the, the mood of people and how people affect to a particular news or particular uh, you know, topic. And in general, if you see that, uh, you know, in this case, the, the last is about happiness. So in general, people are happy after Thanksgiving because probably they would have got uh, a gift or probably they would have met a family member. Uh, so the people are generally, uh, via, you know, they have uh, some uh, surety issues probably before an election result. So they are actually anxious about what's going to happen. So things like that affects uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know, cases, a lot of brands. So uh, this is one of the reasons why sentiment is actually uh, very, very crucial. So why is it actually hard? So to, uh, you know, TLDR, the main reason is language. Uh, sarcasm, for instance, uh, lingo is another problem. So these are all uh, uh, bigger the, the challenges that we actually face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, for example, this movie is just brilliant. Actors are first grade, but the camera work is shoddy at best. So if you see, it starts off good. And then towards the end, it just tapers off and goes back to negative. So, uh, so this in the overall sent sentiment could be positive if you think about you know just put one plus one and then subtract on minus one. But if you see uh, if you see the negative the you know the tone of the uh, whoever wrote this could have been like okay I was okay I was happy with it, but you know in the end it was actually a letdown because the camera work was bad. So uh, the overall sentiment that I have is still negative. But I just wanted to be a nice person, and then I just said, okay, this is good, that's good. So, so this is how, this is the reason why it's actually very difficult to understand uh, sentiment of people and, uh, you know, come up with an algorithm that can actually solve this or give us a proper uh, score for that. And this is another example. So uh, the film runs for a slick 140 minutes. I was just blown away by how true Einstein was after all. So this is one uh, sheer example of how human beings have actually evolved to make sarcasm and uh, you know comedy work for us. Uh, although we have brilliant deep learning uh, or machine learning research that actually uh, works for 99% accuracy and things like that, we cannot a computer cannot understand a joke. A computer cannot understand uh, you know uh, sarcasm. A computer cannot understand emotion. So these are all areas where uh, uh, machine learning and uh, you know, in general, would fail, and this is where probably as humans we will still, uh, you know, stay alive. Or, but still, if you look at it, uh, these are all uh, areas where we can improve and we can understand one another. And uh, you know, probably a machine could actually help us uh, if we were, uh, if the machine was able to understand sarcasm. So uh, this one is quite Singaporean. I was actually quite uh, surprised to see this on the data set. So. <laughs> So uh, this was actually on the data set. This is actually, uh, I think this was probably negative, but, or I think this was positive in that sense. But you, you see what we are saying. So there was a question about uh, 
what happens to punctuation or probably what, what happens to uh, numbers or things like that. But if you see, uh, in this case, uh, a lot cut very short. So uh, the person that you're talking about very short as V short. So these are all uh, the lingo that we use is going to be cultural. And uh, if you see uh, OKLR, I double check with the hard drive. So these are things that will actually evolve only, only when you actually understand the local context. And that is why, uh, you know, uh, having, uh, if you see why Google is having probably a region level uh, Twitter trend or region level data analytics is because all these are very cultural. So uh, data collection on a cultural level, on a regional level, becomes important because you would not be able to understand uh, people's sentiment or people, what people are saying if you're just doing a global uh, data collection. So, and this is the reason why uh, most of our algorithms uh, would fail because humans are in ingenuous in actually making, uh, you know, we, we just come up with new words that another person could actually understand, but uh, a computer would find it very, very difficult because uh, it, it has never encountered that, those words before. So, yep, so that's uh, the, the, some of the reasons and some of the challenges uh, straight off the bat. So uh, one of the reasons, or uh, what is sentiment analysis? Uh, as a simplest, uh, we could actually say that this is to probably uh, find the attitude, if, is it positive or negative? Uh, probably then uh, more complex is rank the attitude between one to 10. And another is uh, advanced is probably identify all the aspects and then give uh, individual scoring for all the aspects, whether they are positive or negative or probably in between neutral. So these are all, uh, so one of the, again, biggest challenges is coming up with an overall sentiment score that becomes an all the more, even more challenge. Um, one of the biggest topics, again, uh, in sentiment analysis that uh, we often encounter is handling negation. So uh, in this example, we see, uh, I really didn't like the food here versus I really like the food here. So just adding one word in between here completely changes the sentiment here. Uh, if, I, if I said, if I, I, so how do we differentiate this? So how do we understand that uh, this word in between is going to change the sentiment? So this is another uh, big area where we want to see uh, which parts of the words are useful. What are the words? So is it probably just the adjectives or probably all the words? Uh, and experimental evidence shows that uh, in most times, uh, all the words actually are uh, use useful. Uh, and what about word occurrence versus word frequency? Uh, for example, uh, if I had said that, uh, you know, this food is amazing, the word amazing is actually quite useful in this context to show the sentiment. But if I actually said amazing like 25 times, it makes no difference because it's actually, it's, it's not going to give me additional data, additional input about how happy I am, but it's only going to show that I am, the overall sentiment is again positive. So it's not going to change the fact that uh, there was one occurrence for uh, useful versus 25 occurrence of useful, it's, it's not going to change the overall sentiment. So that is where another area is, uh, what do we give importance to? Is it word occurrence versus word frequency? So in general, we would uh, do both, but uh, in sentiment analysis, we would actually give uh, importance to word occurrence more. All right, so one more thing is friendliness detection. So this is one thing where uh, another gray area, so that's actually important for analysis. So in some cases, you would say, oh, that must be hard on you. Uh, sorry to hear that uh, it didn't go well. So things like this are, uh, it's very uh, humane. Uh, so uh, we, we cannot actually make a data set out of this, and then we cannot come up with something that could, uh, you know, ha add a gradient to what the sentiment is. But this is still uh, another important area, because uh, if you want to analyze, say, sentiment on Facebook, if someone is feeling, say, suicidal, then we would still want to know uh, how this person, how to help this person. So this could be another area why, uh, you know, text understanding is, uh, is, is more, all the more important. Uh, so if someone actually writes something on Facebook, if it is going to be positive or negative, uh, so the emotion, so all these uh, contribute a, a lot of importance. And uh, so uh, some ways to improve uh, the sentiment detection is uh, we could probably say, so grouping words that actually co-occur. Uh, in general, uh, brilliant was probably an example that actually occurs with positive. Or amazing is actually an, ex uh, an example of a word that could actually occur with a positive sentiment. Uh, another example would be, say, poor. Poor generally occurs probably with uh, negative sentiment. So I would say this, uh, the camera work was poor or the lighting was bad. So things like these, uh, so understanding co-occurrences of words uh, help a lot. And um, 
representation of words uh, become uh, very more, all the more important. So uh, Dr. Andrews actually showed us about uh, word to vec or uh, word embeddings. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, so an example of uh, word to vec was basically uh, man is to woman, is king is to what, is like queen. So in the same case, uh, understanding these uh, semantic relationships would become important because uh, the way in which words occur, uh, you can actually uh, see what are the words that are close by to um, bring the sentiment there. So you can actually say, even though I might not understand a word, if I can understand its neighbors, I can actually understand uh, what the word is talking about. So, uh, so this is another example of how we could actually improve sentiment. And uh, probably, an, again, analyzing the polarity of the words uh, in, in, the word, in the sentence itself is another uh, way we can actually improve the sentiment itself. Uh, here, uh, it, the movie began on a brilliant note, but failed to live up with the expectation in the end, is basically uh, the way in which, you, if you can understand, give importance to words and sentiment of these words separately, instead of giving an overall sentiment, uh, then that would also be useful. And uh, finally, uh, if we could understand the importance of words, so that is actually another uh, important area. So this is what we call attention. So in general, if we have a sentence, this uh, attention was actually uh, from images. So in, in images, you have regions of attention that uh, these are actually visually uh, attentive regions, which actually the eyes are uh, uh, you know, attracted to. Uh, so in text, we've actually adapted this to text as well. So if we can understand what are the most important words, for this example, this was a day that started off on a great note, but there were moments when I thought I was falling asleep until I saw the mouse chase the cat of the house. So, the, the, so it's the, the surprise element is towards the end. So all the other words are more or less boring. But if you see, the, the attention span would be at the end, where the mouse is actually chasing the cat out of the house. So, uh, so the attention is actually more important, again, in, in sentiment. So if you can give words uh, you know, in a way, or you weights based on attention, then that would also serve uh, very useful for uh, doing um, sentiment analysis. So where do we go from here? So one point uh, that's actually very useful is uh, understanding words and uh, how are the words related to one another. So for example, uh, there's a word net from Princeton uh, that actually gives semantic distance between words. So uh, just like how we saw the word embeddings on uh, the tensor board, we can actually do this, uh, something similar to that, but this is more uh, semantic distance from, for, for example, uh, red is a color. And so the distance between red and color would be uh, at, at, at a, a semantic level. So there's a, a, all reds are colors, all greens are colors. So the distance between red and green would be uh, the distance to a color. So effectively, that's something what uh, WordNet would give. But again, WordNet would fail in cases where uh, new words are not there uh, that cannot be semantically mapped. So what we can do is we can use something like word vectors. So word vectors, word embeddings uh, from probably word to vec or GLOW would give us this embedding. So uh, I have, uh, I'll show you what exactly uh, what Dr. Andrews also showed. Uh, I have some example of um, the code that I actually ran here. So this can be done for any sort of word. So you can actually take a, a small corpus of uh, words and then if you have like say 1,000 lines, uh, oops, I'm doing it on the wrong page. Yeah, so this word, uh, so this is something like, uh, you can take uh, some, some random text, some uh, 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 blob of text, and then you can put it to, uh, you can write a tensor. This is a small uh, program that you can write to understand how words are occurring uh, with one another. So what word to vec is doing is basically uh, trying to understand the context of a word from its previous and its next word. So effectively, what it's doing is, uh, it's an unsupervised method wherein uh, you would give no labels. So effectively, what word to vec says that, okay, you have, uh, I live in France, I speak something. So this something would be based on the fact that uh, the, the, there's a, you know, a previous of speak and the next is uh, uh, tomorrow or something like that. So the point is it's trying to bring the context of the word from an earlier context and the next context. So uh, in this, uh, uh, I think this code is available on my GitHub. So you can actually go to this page and then you can, uh, you can go to my GitHub and you can get uh, this code as well. Uh, another example would be something like this. The reason why sentiment is good for, uh, you, if you have a word embedding, is because just like how Dr. Uh, Andrews showed, 
we can actually search for simple words and we can actually figure out what are the closest words here. So effectively, if I can do on a tensor board, I can actually select something like this and I can see what are the words that are actually close in, in that selection. And uh, this will actually give a group of words that are actually close to one another. And that will also help us in do more analysis on, on uh, what are the words that could actually, so in this example that I gave, like for example, if poor and say uh, bad and ugly. So these are all words that could actually co-occur. And if you actually put them on the, uh, in the embedding space, they could all uh, be clustered to uh, on a similar uh, space there. So that's how word to vec or Glob could uh, use, uh, give us help. Uh, another thing is skip thoughts. Skip thoughts is another very, very interesting idea. So uh, just like how word to vec is uh, working on the word, word level, skip thoughts does the same on a sentence level. So effectively, it can actually predict uh, sentences or the context of sentences from its earlier sentence and the next sentence, and then it can uh, actually contextualize the sentence. And uh, this is, again, very, very interesting. Uh, so y you know, we could actually do something like a skip thoughts to understand what the sentence is talking about or do uh, further analysis on the text. And uh, effectively, what we are trying to do here is either train a classifier or a regression. And we are trying to predict, in the classifier, we'll say it's a positive or a negative sentiment. Uh, with the regression, we would give it a scale of, say, 1 to 5 or 1 to 10. And we would say that, OK, so this is a neutral. Is it positive or negative? Things like that. And uh, one more thing is, like I said, uh, we'll, it's good to understand what attention is, uh, how it will help. So if we can bring out all the important words, we can actually say whether this word is probably into some class and how we can actually classify the uh, overall sentence and the sentiment uh, uh, together. And yeah, so there is one very, very cool uh, unsupervised sentiment neuron. So this is a, a, a topic, a research uh, that was actually published by OpenAI. So uh, they have only 4096 sentiment neurons that actually do a complete, uh, so this is an unsupervised uh, paper. So the, the, uh, what you can do is you can, uh, th this, this program has actually learned from over one month of training. And it uh, has actually, it, it is capable of doing, so on the Pentry Bank, it can actually do a close to 92% uh, you know, sentiment analysis. And actually, it can actually classify words uh, uh, on the sentiment tree bank. So uh, you can check this out. So this is actually a very cool, uh, very, very interesting paper. And I think even the code is available. So if, if you want to do some sort of a, um, uh, you know, a sentiment or a feature extraction, you can actually do from uh, the unsupervised sentiment neuron as well. So this is again on TensorFlow. And yeah, so all the, uh, the I have built a sentiment classifier. So in case you're looking at uh, ways to you know either build a classifier or you want to try uh, something on a uh, you know on, on a logistic or a, or a linear or a regression model, you can actually check out uh, my uh, GitHub repository as well. So yeah, so a possible workflow, something that I took from a paper here. Uh, would be something similar to what uh, Dr. Andrew showed earlier. We could do a uh, text extraction and then train a sentiment classification and then extract aspects out of those trained class of, uh, sentiments and then finally aggregate those and then uh, provide a final summary of the actual uh, sentiment. So this is a possible workflow that uh, could be followed. So this is also followed in general uh, when you actually build a large scale uh, sentiment analysis engine. And uh, yeah, thank you. And if you have any questions, uh, let me know.